I was I was super blessed. I got my first day, Kev, right? This is crazy. The he did have to do this, my boss at the time didn't have to do this. He knocked on the studio door and introduced me to Ringo and his producer at the time. I don't know who wow. it would have been. I said, oh, this is Will, the new member of staff. And, um, you know, Ringo was like, oh, well, welcome aboard the mud ship. You know, <laughs> or whatever it was. And I was like, okay, cheers. Tom Petty. Tom Petty. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Hey, thanks for tuning in again to the Tom Petty Project podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brown, and I've already recorded one episode of the Ultimate Catalog Clash, and I'm a couple of beers, so I'm a little bit slurry, a little bit loose. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, today's episode, today's guest ember episode, is the fantastic chat that I had with someone who started out as a listener and has become a long-distance friend, and someone who I, I really enjoy talking to, and actually, I really have to talk to more often. Will Porteous is a man of very many talents who has, on his own podcast, interviewed a ton, I mean, I mean a ton, of top-shelf A-list stars of stage, both theatrical and musical, and screen. As a musician, he's played a ton of Tom's songs, and as a gardener, as you'll discover, uh, has rubbed shoulders with the musical elite. This is a longer episode than normal because Will and I got into some, well, I think they're really interesting areas about podcasting and artistic endeavor in general that I think you'll enjoy listening to. So don't forget to tune in again tomorrow for Will's answers to my 10 questions. For now, though, sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Will Porteous. Yeah. What about so you're, yeah. you're in this now in Norfolk, which was you know hilarious when when I found out that that's where you were moving to or moving back to because I got a, my one of my best friends in the military yeah. who's from this this tiny little town in uh, in rural England. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that where you're from originally? Or where were you brought up? May. I couldn't be not like I couldn't be any further from this, but <laughs> I I think like mentally I feel yeah. like I've, I've, I'm very very far from this. So I I grew up in Surrey. Uh, in a little village called Chillingfold, which is near a bigger town called Guildford. Woohoo! And um, it's a very exciting story, very exciting. <laughs> uh, but we moved here during the, at the epidemic uh, in like the middle of one of the lockdowns. I can't remember which, I can't remember how, it's all just a big weird blur. Like, I feel like I've blinked, fallen asleep and woken up in a, in a field <laughs> somewhere. So um, yeah, and I've got a, a, a larger house because, you know, a flat in London is worth like 18 million quid and a house, a normal house in the country is worth like a normal price. So, yeah. you know, yeah, that's the roundabout way of saying that I, I don't know what the hell has happened in the last two and a half, three years. But where did you grow up then? What was, cause I know you've got connections with, and I'm going to say Southampton or Portsmouth and I can't remember which one it is now. The saints, mate. Don't the ever, saints, yeah. <laughs> ever get confused with that. Um, yeah, no. So I, I was born in Fareham, which is Hampshire, down in uh, the south coast, the kind of near the South Downs. Beautiful, beautiful countryside. Yeah. And then moved, moved like around Hampshire. I just moved to a little town called Farnham, which is which is beautiful. And then about five or six, then men moved to this village called Chillingfold. And it was just beautiful, very, very, very quintessential, mate. Like, like ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the house prices back then were were normal. Normal people could buy things and do things with their lives. Now it's insane. But back then it was just cool, normal. I had a working men's club in the village, right? I yeah. can't, can't even believe that, a working men's club in a Surrey village. And I saw some incredible bands there, mate, just absolutely phenomenal. You know, like Eric, like Eric Clapton would be down there uh, often and, and Damon Hill, believe it or not, um, the random people. Really? And um, yeah, Damon, Damon Hill used to play <laughs> his, I think it was like a Gibson 335, a red one. And um, I have a really, really weird, vi vivid memory of it. And Mike and Mechanics used to practice down there. And um, yeah, it was quite extraordinary. And it, that's, I just used to go see loads of blues bands. Yeah. You would have loved it. You would have absolutely loved it. So are your parents musical? Like what was music like in the house growing up? Yeah, yeah. My my mum my mum was kind of like really weirdly got me into status quo and the great man Tom Petty, um, and the Heartbreakers. And um my 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 dad was but was vaguely musical. He's a little bit like you were saying earlier. 
uh, a, a restless creative, a little bit like me. Like he wasn't like suit like you know a writer or anything like myself, but he he would you know constantly be challenging himself either to cycle way more than he should or pick up the saxophone or yeah. the flute the flute or what have you and he, here's a quintess the, the most quintessential thing you can ever dream of really is I, I was in a church band from about the age of 14 behind the drums rocking it <laughs> with with my dad on the saxophone sometimes on the flute oh yeah and uh yeah it was like my dad and then my mate Paul, who was like 10 years older than me on the bass. And then that slowly evolved into like meeting real normal people and bands and music. So I got yeah. a very, very sheltered, sweet um, upbringing in, in, in music. And I'm like, uh, I don't know if you want me to talk about a first gig or anything, just to give a rough idea. Yeah, sure. But um, yeah, my first, my actually, my first ever gig was the Kinks at Portsmouth Guildhall in '96. Oh I think. my god! Wow. But then I say that that's probably a load of bullshit because it was, it was, it was, a, it was definitely the Kinks is one of my first memories of a gig, right? Yeah. And then, but my all my all time first memory was was like that really just kicked everything into gear was seeing Status Quo at Wembley Arena. Yeah, and um, everybody just going mad to rocking all over the world. Like it was, it was something else. It was ge- it was genuinely like a calling. Like it went off inside me. And I, I think there are loads and loads of people, obviously, that would have that experience. What would do you have one? It, it's funny though we say about Quo because they're sort of they're one of those bands now. I think that is just completely forgotten. But they were one of the biggest bands in the UK for a long time. Yeah, and one definitely. of the biggest live acts as well. And they put on a great show, and it was rock and roll, right? Right. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go to gigs growing up really. I, or I, I remember seeing my dad play lots, and would go watch him practice. So that was my first exposure to live music. Was what what do your dad play? Practice. My dad played guitar in lot, like a diff- couple of different, pretty good draw pub bands, but just cover yeah. bands, you know. But listen That's to him cool. play like "All Right Now" and you know "Take It Easy" and all these songs, and sitting yeah. on a, a bunch of fruit boxes in Uncle Dennis's back room and then in, in the grocers. Oh, Same Prices. thing. Right? It's a very pastoral sort of working class upbringing, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I was going to say to you too, Will, that I, you said something there that I always find interesting, that your dad was sort of that restless creative type. And I, I do find that, because my dad was a musician, my mum always yeah. encouraged that. And being around people who are like that, it definitely sort of, I think it gives you license to do it yourself, right? You sort of think, yeah. oh, oh I, I can do that. Then I can just write a book if I want to, and I don't need to ask anyone's position, or I don't need to worry about yeah. this or that, or I can be in a band. or And I always like that. And people who grow up with musicians around the house or musical instruments yeah. around the house, you're just more likely to drift into it, I think. You know? I think so, yeah. This is, it's a, I can't remember what the, the phrase is or the saying is, that you get like a license to do something. It's your, whether if you're creative, whatever it might be, that someone, it, you read a, something in, from an article and it gives you the license to then go, oh, it's okay yeah. to do that. It's and, it, and although, yeah, I saw my dad like playing sax and flute or whatever yeah um and, and then and then i got drawn into like like village events you know so like I, I, trying to scrape a band together to play the like the local fun day or the yeah. local tom tombola day or whatever it is and um finding myself like playing like you're yeah, like exactly like all right now do you know what i mean like nights in white satin that kind of yeah. stuff um and all, all i said su- i suppose in a way yeah you know there was a bit of a license there i could I, I was able to 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 play the drums and it wasn't like a big deal, you know, you know, you should be doing your maths, you should be doing your English, yeah. get ready for your exams, and, you know, because I've, I've, I've always struggled with dyslexia massively my entire life. So academia was, com- I just passed me by completely. But um, yeah, I suppose you're right. You know, having someone in the house who's vaguely musical does, does give you a bit of a license. It's quite cool. And, and my God, you know, it's, it's special because sadly, you know, my dad died when I was 22. So I, yeah. I don't really have an awful lot of core. I have core memories of him, but I don't, they're, they're very, they're, you know, they're, they're not, it's not like they're ebbing away and they'll never lose some of their potency, but being able to like sometimes close my eyes and, and think about those moments in church, like I'm not religious at all, Yeah, but to, to think about that church environment and to think about him playing um, is really essential. And that does actually chime in with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers because that music was just so important in our family um, to such a degree. And and 
I suppose why we're sat here talking now because yeah. it, it's like you you know music just sews you together as a as a family you know um, and if you're lucky enough to have that you know yeah it's, there's a funny thing there too with I think with English people especially because you can like church and not be religious because there's something about the atmosphere of those old buildings with a, a pipe organ and a good organist and a choir it's it's beautiful. I don't care what anyone yeah. says. I love Amazing Grace as much as I love Mary Jane's Last Dance, right? <laughs> says, music says is music. the band that loves prog rock, right? It's, exactly, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's something about an organ, Will. It's not, it, come on, mate, just be honest, yeah. You just want a fat organ sound. <laughs> hey, you're the, the one bringing up, you're the one bringing up, bringing up flutes. I mean, I'm not <laughs> yeah, bringing up Jack Rotulli. <laughs> <Italy. laughs> fair play, mate, fair play. You got me there, cheeky, cheeky so, bugger. <laughs> what was the first then, what's your first memories of, of Peddy's music then? Like you said, obviously, if your mum was listening to yeah. it, it was at the house. Do you remember sort of a... a a pivotal moment of thinking, hey, who's this guy? I like that specifically. Yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, because I know you were like you got into Petty's music a little later, a little further down the line. Yeah. For me, I was rough, I was roughly 10 years old. So it's my mum goes into <laughs> this is a throwback. My mum goes into W. H. Smith's, right? So those are people <laughs> that don't know what, what W. H. Smith is, is a I don't know what it's like a it's a posh stationery um place kind of news agents kind of right stationery type yeah but enormous and they used to do music they used to sell I think they used to sell actual vinyl records as well but my mum bought the cassette of Into the Great Wide Open and um look I can't remember when or where but I was in the car it was in the car somewhere and I heard those guitars for the first yeah. time and that was it that was just what the hell is what is this <laughs> what is this yeah. like i you know and i can remember that with a few songs i can remember that with um jimmy hendrix live at the isle of white festival um johnny be good or, or whether it's berkeley university i can't remember which and then it was um nebworth when page or plant did um rock and roll and being yeah. just like what is the and then my dad playing me in the car and being like that's it that's the song that's the, that's dad that's the song that's the song <laughs> and like but it being just such a huge part of me and listening to that album i was listening to obviously i was listening to into, into the great one open today because uh, to ref not refresh my memory because i've listened to it more than any album ever any yeah. other it's the most listened to album um, but then I was listening to the Isle of Skye the other day with my daughter. We were going around the Isle of Skye in Scotland for about um, a week, just her and I. And I, I, put, I, I put it on with all this stupidly, ridiculously beautiful background, right? Yeah. The scenery that just melt your eyes and explode your heart in the best possible way. And yeah, it it's extraordinary, man. And I think, I think yeah, it's my mum in a car. She She heard it immediately it, it, and, and had to buy it she immediately yeah. she was just like i don't know what this is this, this has to be owned and God, I, can't, I can't even I, i'm telling you right now if she hadn't got that there's every chance i never would have i would never have listened to tom petty there's every chance because my uncle who yeah. loved him he he i very, very very rarely saw my uncle when i was growing up um tom petty was never big in the uk ever yeah. forget it so you know, and it's the great one. Was his biggest album. I mean, that's the only one that topped really? the chart. Right? But that was his by far his biggest album in UK. Yeah, it was bi the biggest seller, and learning to fly and integrate would open the two biggest. I mean, Full Moon Fever. You would think because yeah, it nominally was a bigger album in terms of sort of sales. But going through and listening to Integrate Wide Open, it's sort of it's this. I always think it's the same thing. Maybe we'll start start talking a little bit about the album. Then is I always think yeah. the same thing with Long After Dark is the end of that Iovine trilogy. And that's when they perfected that sound. That's when they can write songs yeah. like that just perfectly in their sleep. Into the Great Wide yeah. opens almost that same thing where he's gone through Full Moon Fever and the Wilburys, and he's just locked into that vibe now. Him and Jeff Lynne are just knocking him out left, right, and center. There's not yeah. a filler track on that album on Into the Great Wide Open. Every song's just like, holy shit, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, totally, mate. I think, I'd like for me, it's like, you know, it... For, for some very weird reason, I think it's got, for me personally, me personally, underlined personally, right? It's, it's got more legs than Full Moon Fever for me because yeah. um, because I've just heard the other songs so much on the radio. I want to, I, I, I don't turn the radio off because it's still mad. You can't turn Petty off. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's, it's just too much. So Integrate What I Open is a deeply personal album, I, you know, but just before we go on to the album, it's it, to get really nostalgic, mate, because I think so much of Petty's music is tied up with nostalgia with, with an awful lot of people, is that 
th- th- this album went on every holiday we ever went on every summer you yeah. know th- as soon as the sun came out the barbecue came out William go and put on Tom Petty go and put on Tom Petty <laughs> um it just those the, you know learn to fly guitars as soon as that that wall of lid guitars kicks yeah. in that's the summer that's when it starts you know and there's there's no getting around it you know my sisters don't feel the same and it's it's a very nostalgic thing i i wonder you know i wonder if anybody else has that you know i uk us whatever like ever has that has that connection with 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 his with his music like you put on a specific petty song and it kicks that's you yeah, almost 100%. save it for the summer yeah Hundred percent. I mean, I've, talk- I've talked to guests though about exactly that, right? Because there are there's albums from every artist that are just so deeply sort of ingrained in your DNA. Like Beatles for Sale for me. I think Revolver's my favorite Beatles album now because I think it's their best album. I mean, you can make an argument with Sgt. Pepper, everything else, but Beatles for Sale was the one that I sat in front of my dad's record player with headphones on for hours, listening to over and over and over again. Love and it. so, of course, of course, those ones that you're always going to go back to. But when it's a family, like if the whole family loves it, then those are fewer and far between, I think, right? So that makes it even just that tad more special for you, I'm sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think there are a lot of bands like that, you know, what I call, like, it's really weird to describe this, really, really hard to, I I cannot articulate it enough. Or sorry, I can't try and describe it enough because there are Saturday morning bands, right? My dad would go to the record player on a Saturday morning when always... The bullshit stress of his 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 life and 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 job, his self employed work was just absolutely grinding him down. And you'd hear him put on like I don't know Graceland or whatever, yeah. And it would it would it would it would it'd send a vibe through the house. It's Saturday, Dad's doing okay. Let's chill. Um, and 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 it, for me, Petty's music is is Saturday morning music, and it's hard to describe what that is. I think to articulate it, I would need to write a freaking essay on it, mate. Hey, yeah. you're a good writer. I think that's something you should explore because that is an interesting, <laughs> I think Saturday weekend mornings and the same thing with me growing up because we weren't oversaturated with media. I didn't really have activities to do because I grew up in a working class family. You just kind of hung around and did whatever. But Saturday mornings, there was something about those and I was the same thing. It was music in our house. So it was yeah. Beatles for Sale. It was the Kings. It was T-Rex. It was Deep Purple and Zeppelin and, and The Who and all these great bands that have stuck with me ever since then, because apart yeah. from the music just being bloody brilliant, there's just that connection that will never go away, right? Oh, totally, mate. I mean, like, just you you, you referencing The Who there, for me, it was just Who's Next. It was yeah. Baba O'Reilly just, just, just hearing that for the first time and just, you know, won't get fooled again or whatever. Just, just, wow, like, this <laughs> is just... It's, 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 for me, it's drug music. It's just, it really is, you know. Uh, it's that it's that, that first hit of rock and roll, right? It's because like, I've said it on the tiny, podcast before. Tiny. The first time I heard Black Dog, I was like, oh, this is my music. Yeah. And I like Mum's Rod Stewart and I love classical music, but this is for yeah. me. This has yeah. just made everything tighten up and now I'm just happy, right? So And that, that's why you're a drummer. That's exactly why you're a drummer, <laughs> right? Because you heard Black Dog and it went in. That was like your your like entry music, right? Your entry track. That was a slow burn though. I didn't pick up my drums <laughs> till I was 40. So I was I was a pianist. Really? I, was, I was a pianist, yeah. For I played. Oh my god! I, kid, I thought yeah. you've always been a drummer. That's mental. No. I think that's no. me projecting. I thought we were because <laughs> I picked up the drums when I was fourteen. So no, yeah. no, fuck that. I was like twelve or something. I can't remember. Yeah. And it, yeah, my mum and dad bought me a drum kit, and uh, I went into my and they surprised me with it, and I just I I, I fell on the floor and fainted for real. <laughs> oh. Yeah, mental. Just overwhelmed. Yeah, totally. It was crazy. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. So when you start playing, then you said like your first bands let's just jump back a little bit to that though because who are you trying to are you trying to sound like someone or are you is it literally just we'll play anything was did you have heroes as a drummer what was your sort of entry into actually playing and playing live well i i'm not a very technical drummer i've always been a ringo star drummer i've always just been backbeat is my my go-to and i've I've, you know i've played like loads loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and and it's always just been like stop showing off and just keep to the groove for god's sake man um so when i was growing up i was all, always immediately lim- limited so like i i would i would drum along to like lemon song you know or um heartbreaker and uh just just keep the groove as, as best yeah. i could um but then i'd, I'd love drumming along to status quo because that was just like really really easy uh just four you know four, four on the floor and yeah 
yeah or like trying to learn the blues shuffle which was pretty tricky but i mean mate i had like this crappy argos catalog ghetto blaster <laughs> you know and like that would just be on full blast and i'll be pounding the drums my neighbor who was a veteran from the desert rats in the second world war <laughs> used to love it he had a butcher's shop and he used to go Oh, them drums, oh, I love them drums. Reminds me of the drummers in the war. I love it. I love marching music. His name was Mr. Paul, and he was a he was a rotter. He was an absolute rotter, but he was brilliant. Yeah. And um, and yeah, my mum and dad, you know, Christ, you know what it's like? You hear a drum, you hear a drum kit in a house now when you're separated from it all. You think, bloody hell, that is a racket. It's loud. It, it's yeah. really loud. <laughs> I don't know how they put up with it, genuinely. But they did. Yeah. And I think, you know, they they I think they realized how important it was to be because I was obsessed, I was utterly obsessed with music. Yeah. You know, I think I wanted to be because like when I went to boarding school, I took a, a guitar with me, this piece of crappy electric thing with me. And uh, you know, I didn't I, you know, I, I tried my best and and what have you, never really got any not didn't get any good, but it wasn't until after school that I really, really picked up the the guitar and 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 what yeah. have you wanted to to progress that. But um, the drums were the bedrock for me. And I tell you, man, anybody, anybody who's got an idea of oh, should I do guitar or drums, and they love them equally, just do the drums because everyone needs a drum. There, are, the drummers are in short supply, man. You can always you know? get a gig. As a bass player or a drummer, yeah. you're always going to have a gig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just just do it. For God's sake, we need drummers. The world needs them. It's also great stress relief too, though, right? I mean, you yeah. know, th there's the technical and the precision of playing, and it's, it's nice to try and learn it. But sometimes, if you need to let off a bit of steam, just turn turn everything up, crank it up, and just pound on them. There's yeah, but really, than that. really quickly, what, what age 40, what got you into the drums? What was it? Just fuck the, it, I've got to do this. Well, I've always been, I always tap. I would always, I mean, my wife goes, can you please stop tapping? So if anything's on, I've always yeah. drummed along to it. But of course, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, as, as a, again, working class kid, not to, oh, we were poor when I was growing up. We had our barely yeah. a two pence, you know. <laughs> right, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Just didn't have any money to buy drums. And my uncle was a drummer, so I kind of tapped around, I think, a little bit on his. But honestly, it was yeah. it was the video game Rock Band. Um, oh, friends really? of ours got Rock Band, and I went over and I said, oh, I can actually, I can coordinate my arms and legs. I understand where the parts are. I can yeah. play, so kept playing a little bit and then recorded my first song with my friend Randy and went and literally called and said, well, he said, do you want to try some drums? I'm like, I mean, I can give it a go. So the first yeah. drum part I ever played is recorded on one of the, the first songs I got. So oh, after that, I thought, you know what? I, I think I'll, I might, I might try this. So for my 40th birthday, I got, uh, I got a drum kit. Mate, I love that. That's so cool. You probably got a reasonably good one age 40. I'm, I'm thinking not like the piece of shit I had growing up. It's my little DTX, yes, Yamaha DTX. From yeah. Five or the two one, or something. It's a decent little So the, the electric behind you? Yeah. Nice. Love it, man. Like the electric kits now are insane. They're off. They're, I remember having an electric uh, drum kit in the, uh, oh my goodness, the early noughties, late yeah. late 90s, and it was a gee, wow. <laughs> Used to turn up to, to gigs with it, and there's the tech, the, the uh, sound guy would look at you going, uh, <laughs> ja, it's not Halloween, mate. <laughs> Where's your drum kit? Right, what do you, you want me to do with this? It's a drum kit, mate. Is it? Is yeah. it? We're, we're a new band, man. This is the new sound, man. <laughs> Paul well, Collins was, used to talk about um, playing those, the early Simmons drums, right? And he said it's like playing for Micah, but it's like a foot because there's really? no give. So it kills yeah. your wrist. You can't, like, there's no nuance, you know. So just bashing around. And I'm <laughs> but it's great fun. It's great fun to play them. So, Interestingly, though, I think that you were talking about because you know what you're describing there for people who, and I've used this term on the on the podcast before. You're a pocket drummer, then you just like sit in the groove, play the B, and I'm, I'm the same. I'm you not know, a I'm not a super straight. technical drummer at all, right? But that's where you know Petty and the Heartbreakers have Stan Lynch, who I wouldn't describe as a pocket drummer. He's he's a flare drummer and he, he throws all sorts in. Where then they get Steve Ferroni in. Definitely. Now Steve has got way okay. more chops than almost any drummer on the planet, but yeah. he's more than happy to just sit in the pocket and be that heartbeat and that yeah. backbeat. Because that's what I love, right, man? When I, when they talk about Steve Ferroni's audition, and he's just yeah. like, doof, 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 doof. yeah. Oh, um, what track is that that he auditioned and just nailed? Uh, it? Uh, you don't know how it feels. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, 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 yeah. Do. I feel, I, I feel like I'm doing um, a Bruce Hornsby song there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like that, that that's the kind of you know that gives you license. Drummers like that give you license to go. Hey, you know. People want the backbeat, you know, not necessarily the punter, yeah. but some people in you're in a band, you walk in, be yourself. I mean, Jesus wept, you know, you're gonna what you're gonna do. 
because I remember that in the running down the dream doc, it was like they were saying like how, you know, they, they auditioned a bunch of um, drummers. And I think this was in between like uh, the when they were doing um, the Damn Torpedoes album or something and they're having problems they, with with Stan and or trying to get a different sound. I don't know what the hell it was. But they were, you know, we auditioned a lot of drummers, but none of them were with Stan, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. Like, and, and people do drummers down so, so much. But man, you get in a band and you get a good, and you get a... a, a, a okay drummer okay drummer versus the drummer and yeah. it transforms everything you know and a bad and drummer just, can and a bad drummer can kill a band completely God, still in bed right if, or if, totally. even not the right drummer for that band yeah yeah and like i think that's why i just wanted to i just wanted to just yeah and just prove yeah. it man because it's, it's it's simple and people dig it you know yeah. I love that story. Beat, the word is on the street. That, that story you were saying, though, but like the, with when Ferroni comes in and Kenny Aronoff is loading out and they haven't told oh, really? him who the auditions for, and he's like, Kenny Aronoff didn't book this? Who the hell is in there? You know, <laughs> but it just because, you know, great plays again. But, and I also think that I've talked about this lots, and you think about, you know, Ferroni or I can't never, Phil Rudd from ACDC. Oh, brilliant. It sounds really, really simple, brilliant. but they've got a very specific timing in a very specific groove. So yeah. you don't know how it feels. Sounds like anyone should be able to play it, but you've really got to pay attention to play it properly. Yeah, and but... it's like one of those weird tempos for a drummer too, right? Where it's it's in an uncomfortable tempo because it's you want to go faster on that song, but no, you got to slow it down. It's got to be played that fast. Totally. However, you this is the thing when I I, I spoke to Steve for only for my little podcast, right? And I didn't I didn't know how to articulate this, and I didn't know how to say to him, "I love your simplicity." Yeah. without sounding like a you know being rude because i don't know him like, he doesn't know me <laughs> um we probably only grew up like 50 miles from each other or whatever but like i was you know obviously a few years apart <laughs> but you know but I, I i just got the you know i, I kind of i think i did okay but essentially i just want to say to him I, I just love your simplicity and it just you know you can really it, it allows the free the, you know the foundation for other instruments to do what they want to do yeah and I think you know that's that's what I do. That's what, probably what I love about Into the Great Wide Open, actually. You know, because it's it is, you know, it's not very flary at all. But when there is, you know, a bit of bit of flair, Jesus, it it pops out. Yeah. Well, I was listening to so the last episode was that learning. Um, sorry, King's Highway. Right. And I've never yeah. really picked up on and noticed that in the second, I think the second two verses, because I always think it's like two verses to start, two verses chorus, two verses chorus. But Stan starts playing in the back half of that phrase. He's playing like this big fill on the toms. So he does a double snare hit, and then he plays this big fill. But you don't notice it because it's mixed a bit lower, okay. and he's not syncopating it, and he's not overplaying it. He's not over-egging it, and it's just perfect. But it's playing. It's, um, just that ability to play for the song is so important. Yeah. And I think Tom was always lucky with his drummers, right? He just knew exactly who needed to be on, on what records. I'm going to pick you up and take you far yeah. away. Yeah, now now you've got me thinking. Yeah, because I I've I've all, oh man, I think that is an um, um perhaps like not maybe overlooked as a percussive album because I think like yeah, you know, there's a lot of percussion that 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 album that really lifts lifts it and uh, lifts certain tracks. There's the yeah. um, well, you were talking about um the track the other day, whether it was learning to fly or I can't remember what song now it was. Perhaps the second track, but whatever it was. Um, there's you know a a, a a wooden block that's being hit, mm -hmm. right? and I oh I dig that. I love a wooden block with a bit of reverb. Yeah, that's what oh. into fly out right? that. Yeah, cha 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 yeah. cha cha, right. and it comes in off on the yeah. on the different beat and finishes on a different bar. Again, just those little things that they add in, and yeah, I mean this one definitely because you know Full Moon Fever was was Phil Jones was playing drums, and it's it's very very straight that one. There really isn't there's barely anything in that apart from when Kelton plays yeah. on. On, I can't remember which song it is now. But with this one again, when Stan comes back in, well, now it sounds like Full Moon Fever aesthetically because Jeff Lynne's still producing it and he's mixing his toms a certain way and the snare sounds a certain way. But the playing itself, it only yeah. sounds like Stan Lynch because they like said Steve Ferroni wouldn't play it that way. Yeah, totally. You know, and so. it, yeah. I mean, you've got so many, like, for, you know, the, making some noise is a. It's oh, just man. like a prime example, isn't it? Down, 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 down. And when they're drunk, yeah. bah, 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 oh, you know, <laughs> it's just solid, man. Like, if you were a kid growing up, it's probably one of the 
one of the best rock tracks that you could get because it's it's going to get you into country rock as well it's yeah. going to you know it's going to going to feed your appetite and you hopefully your um desire to find what else is out there and i i think that's what i loved about it also like you know seeing my dad rock out to it right you know yeah. that's that's an important thing i think mark mark maron spoke about this with his you know mark maron the, the podcaster yeah he yeah he was like talking about how his, his dad was a pretty messed up guy but he would see his dad you know when he was driving rocking out to like buddy holly or whatever yeah and that, and and it was like oh my god you know my dad's my dad's doing okay this is great what's this music it's it's gonna be okay yeah you know i think not that my dad was a, a psychopath or anything but you know just to see him rocking out you know it's like when we first listened to to gary moore he, gary moore did this amazing live blues album blues alive i think and there's a um, walking by myself which is basically oh, I mean, metal blues yeah <laughs> And I mean, my dad, man, he came into this lit to the living room like with the biggest smile. He was like beaming with excitement. You've got to listen to this track, well, you've got to listen yeah. to this track. And uh, you know, I was blown away when I heard it, man. I couldn't, I, I didn't know that the blues, the blues could sound like that because I was a bit, of, <laughs> you know, I was like, you know, like blues, sort of like old school blues, you know, Sonny Boy Williamson, Elmore James, and like yeah. when I first heard that, I was like, freaking hell, you know. Well, it's when they brought the rhythm into the blues, right? So when you get real rhythm and blues, and that's where rock and roll comes from, and it's what yeah. a lot of modern rock bands forget is you've got to put the roll back in there. And making some noise is such a great example of that because that swings yeah. so hard. It's so good, you know? And it's, it's funny because... And I'm going to ask you a question later uh, in my 10 questions, and I'm going to throw back to that song because I thought of... Um, well, basically, it's if you could pick any artist to pick any Tom Petty song, and I thought of an artist yeah. who would cover this, uh, making some noise, and crush it i think they do a brilliant job of it because oh, okay. it's exactly because it's a blues rock song so yeah okay all right then i've got i've got a couple got a couple for you as well young man excellent well, before before we get into 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 the great opening in a bit of depth um well so i wanted to talk about you just you mentioned that you had your own podcast and you yeah. sort of threw that away as a little comment and people should know that will interviewed i mean some uh, a-list we're not let's not sugarcoat you, <laughs> some a-list human beings like when i saw michael palin on your podcast like, yeah, oh, man. That, is there another michael palin who's like an accountant or a <laughs> oh that's the michael palin so tell us about the limehouse podcast how that came about and and, and the journey with it because i know it's sort of on yeah. either hiatus or yeah right. no the de definite hiatus but um yeah i got it going so it used to be a political thing a, a political vehicle if you will um and um yeah, i was I, I was a big liberal democrat fan okay yeah you know i went to church and uh i just you know it was a natural progression for me it was the paddy ashdown and the liberal democrats and i think that's yeah my dad you know just he he you know radio fours are in the background and then in question time yeah. and then obviously brexit happened and completely just messed our country up and it's still messing our country up yeah. and i was like yeah i want to do something about this so i started i started this podcast order to ask people within the Liberal Democrats, what, what was going on and if there was any hope to be had. And then I got pretty pretty bored pretty quickly of just the Lib Dems. And I sort of cast my net really wide and I you know, started interviewing people like um, Michael Heseltine and Ken Clark. So uh, Michael Heseltine was a former um, Deputy Prime Minister of the UK and Ken Clark was a Chancellor of the Exchequer. Really, 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 really big hitters in their time. Yeah. Um, and then Nick Clegg, leader of the um, Lib Dems, I mean, just so many political figures. Um, and I managed to get like front page of the um, the Guardian for like three days over Christmas period. Because my mate, well, my mate, my next door neighbour was a, a, a political editor of the um, the Guardian. And said, look, I, she, I wanted to interview, but she said, no, can't you, you can't interview me. But I'll, you know, I'll, I don't know, I'll listen to one of your podcasts and see if there's anything newsworthy. Yeah. And she just drew up this massive bit that I completely missed in this interview I did with Michael Heseltine, which basically he said he'd prefer the Corbyn government to Brexit, which just just freaking yeah, blew a lot of Tory minds, you know. Which yeah, is yeah, very, yeah, yeah. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, simple, simple. <laughs> very, very easily offended people. And so um yeah, yeah. And, and and it was great, you know, for about 18 months, two years. But yeah. I don't know. I just got really disillusioned by politics, and also, you know, I didn't also get. I didn't really build up a relationship with 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 the listeners. You know, they didn't. It's it was it was it was weird. I think they thought that I just went out and got these interviews, and I was somehow affiliated with the BBC or something. 
you know, I'm a freaking gardener. I was like one minute <laughs> gardening in southeast London, then hightailing up to Westminster to do an interview with X, Y, or Z. One one moment, one particular interview was mental for Michael Hessel time. I was on my way to the to the interview and I was driving to the tube station and I got got in a road rage situation. A bloke went off his he went absolutely mental. I I just hooted him because he was parked in the middle of a one-way street, blocking all the traffic. <laughs> he ended up getting out of his car and and hitting my van with my with his fist. I was, like, I, I was like running, I, I reversed down the street fast again. He got in his, his car. And there was this like a five minute chase around all these all these roads. Me just I'm freaking out, don't know what to do. I passed the police car, waved the police car down, and they they just they they just sorted them out basically. They just like blues and twos, wow. chased him off, and then you're like, you're right, mate, you're right. I was like, yeah, I've got to get I've got to get for an interview. So I'm like literally sweating with with terror get yeah. to the you know still just about calmed down enough to the interview with michael Hesseltine, leave the interview <laughs> get, get back to gardening and then that's the interview that gets me the headlines in the, in the guardian wow. but i don't know it's a, it's a mad mad little anecdote that i think but then i i'm i don't know i just got bored and then put the podcast down for a year and a half when i came back i thought Do you know what? i want to talk to people that like they're in music like um yeah, and I just I hooked some really big fish down the line by like building up slowly, like doing sort of lesser known actors or musicians, and then getting further and further up the the the, the ladder, I suppose. But it yeah. was like you know for, for people that you know obviously music lovers listen to this show. I did like um, a deep dive with your your mate um, Paul Zollo, who is probably one of the nicest men in the oh entire my God. universe. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I, I love that you had such a good time with him. He's adorable. Yes, and and, continue, and it's nice through Facebook. We're sort of Facebook friends, and we chat every now and again. Like you yeah. said, he's just such a personable man, and doesn't need to engage with his readers or anybody beyond the fact that he's just just a genuinely nice fella. Totally. You know I mean, totally. I, I do another guy though that you had on that I was looking at again. I think this is, I can't remember what it was. Was Fergal Sharkey. Who's yeah, again sort of a guy who's been sort of lost to the annals of time a little bit, but just turned yeah. up on Have I Got News for You? Oh, really? Yeah, because he's, he's very active as very political, very political now. And and I mean, he wasn't suited to Have I Got News for You because he's not combative at all. Like he's not a okay. well, he's not a dick, you know. Which he kind yeah. of have to be a little bit to be on that show. But it was great yes. seeing him because I remember I remember Fergal Sharkey from you know back way back in the day. I grew up, yeah. you know, as, as you did. His voice was just on the radio all the time. But so you had all these cousin, all these guests yeah. on there, and and so, but yet it was very eclectic too, right? Because like you said, you had actors and you had even musicians and people from all different sorts of parts of of the industry. And what you're saying though, I, I think that it's the same thing with bands, right? It doesn't matter. Unfortunately, the quality of your show doesn't really matter. Like indie podcasters or like indie musicians, unless you get a break or you get someone backing you, it's so hard to build. No matter, like, oh, you can have God, the best yeah. guest in the world. It's just so hard to build, right? It and is. It is really. It is really hard. And I think it's, it's important for people to understand that, like, because independent podcasting, um, it, it is. It is. It's a. It's a love, right? That you. You, yeah. know, you do it for the love of it, and yeah, sure. If uh, it's for some reason it takes off, wonderful. You know, wow. You know, I don't have to be a gardener for the rest of my life. This is going to be great. Yeah. But it, it does. It does um, involve an awful lot of hard work and. Uh, sacrifice to to a degree but no one's asking me to do it. i'm not like you know no one's holding a gun to my head no or our, our heads to do it but it but were it not for the fact that people doing this you you wouldn't have all you would have would be npr and the bbc and or like murdoch outlets and yeah and you'd be buggered so you know the advent of podcasting saved my life as a gardener like i genuinely mean that because i'm I've had serious anxiety and depression in my life. And as soon as podcasting came along, I was able to garden with these fantastic people yeah. in my head, like, you know, Mark Maron or what have you. Um, and thank, you know, thankfully when I found your podcast, I, I, you know, I'm feeling a lot better now these days, but That's you good. know, I was, it, it was a, it was a different, it was a different kettle of fish, but you know, I wish you'd been around like 50, like 10 years ago. If you'd been yeah. around 10 years ago, you'd probably be like a, a, a world famous superstar podcaster. Maybe. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but you know, because well, like, I mean, and the thing with this podcast too is though, that it's very specific, 
you know what i do on the podcast the is extremely specific and it's it's if you're not yeah. into tom people say oh you've got a podcast it's tom petty podcast yeah oh i should listen to it uh i mean do you love tom petty oh i know well eh, but, you know, I but the thing is with niche people anybody that wants to start up a podcast should know that the more niche it is the more chance it actually has of, of breaking for, or, or finding yeah. an audience because if you just did like a generic film podcast, all right, you know, good luck, mate. You know, everyone's got a bloody film podcast. But, but yeah, no, people need it because, Jesus wept, I grew up in, in an environment of zero petty. Like there was petty from my family, obviously, but none of my mates knew he was. Yeah. He was never on the radio, forget that. So, you know, when he came, when, whenever he'd come on like the radio on, the, on like the very, very random times, it was like, what the hell? And when you were talking about, you know, learning to fly... You know, well, integrate when you're, you're going into it now, hence our chat. Um, you know, it, it's deeply personal to me because I know you know you've done for you've done all the albums up to now, but this one for me, you talking about it, it's what is really bizarre is it feels deeply personal to me. This is like, you know, uh, uh, okay, Kev's talking about this album, but it's on a different level. Everybody knows about Down the Torpedoes, Full Moon Fever, whatever, you know. Yeah. And what have you? But this, for me, is the secret to my heart. This album. This is like if you get this album, this is me, you know. So it's like tread carefully on these songs, mother trucker. You know, <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. You do what do what you like, mate. Do what you like. It's a free world for God's sake. But but what a privilege to be able to do that too, though, right? I mean, and this connection yeah. that I've had, you know, we sort of connected fairly early on. I think in in my sort of little podcast journey, quote unquote. Very. I hate, I hate the word journey. It's just a bit. It's all for you today. It's like my my journey. No, so in in my trip, let's say that. Then that's more English. Yeah. Trip. My book up my podcast trip. But well, so your trip, had, lad. Your, your trip, lad. you trip for fuck's sake? <laughs> I've had that with so many people that that's the joy of it. You know, what I mean, yeah. th- like I said, I've, I've said to other people that I decided to set this on because I thought that by doing it and forcing myself to be disciplined about doing every song and sticking to a weekly schedule, I thought I'll get a lot out of it musically. But yes. the 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 sort of the community that I've found. And the people that I've met have enriched my life to such a degree that I just can't imagine not having all these people and, and you know, like you in my life. It's, just... did, did, it's very interesting you say that because I used to say that about my podcast, but I always used to say it um, to make myself feel better because it wasn't true. So I would interview like Jack Davenport or Palin or whoever the hell. But are they my mates? No, they're not my mates. They, yeah. They've forgotten about the interview after 30 seconds after I said, see you later, mate. Yeah. Um, with this, you know, you're you're talking to normal people that are like probably gonna affect you. Have a you know, you're gonna reach back into their lives and, and vice versa. It's, it's yeah, it's really important. And also the people that not aren't even on your show, just the normal, you know, like people like me, where I'm not, you know, wanting to chat with you about this album. That means a lot, you know. That, that for, you know, there's certain validity it adds to their love for petty and knowing that there's somebody out there that is as geeky if not slightly geekier you yeah. know and it's and that's a very 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 important thing to to have people cherish it because you know if you weren't doing it well there's no one else that's doing it and like it's either that or bruce springsteen i adore bruce you know i'm a massive massive springsteen fan but like yeah. you know an awful lot of bandwidth is taken up by bruce you know so it's very cool that you're doing this and i'll stop blowing smoke like up your ass soon they blow away us. That's, that's always lovely. Yeah. And it, well, I, it's always nice when it's genuine, right? And that's the thing yeah. is, and you can is tell when people. Up your ass, is blow smoke up your ass in, an insult, or is it? Is it I, can't, well, I, can't, I can't work yeah. out if I just insulted you. Well, no, it just means you're if you're yeah, you're sort of. <laughs> bit, did I, Kevin? Did I, did I, did I just <laughs> insult you? Did I? Did I like, let's rewind. <laughs> you're English, of course. I mean, I was, I was talking to work colleagues today about you know when when you say something, um, if someone says to you, "Oh, you should try this food," if an English person, if you give them food and, and they say, "I don't mind it," yeah, that's yeah. not a compliment. <laughs> yeah, we have a very yeah. specific way of insulting each other. So yeah, yeah, yeah true, true, yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the album a little bit then, because like you said, it's it's important to you. And, and again, going back and you know, for, from what I do with the podcast is I'll sit and listen to the album two, three times on vinyl. Um, if I have it, which I have everything up to this point at least, just to get that sort of experience of listening to the album as an album. Then I'll yeah. go in and start listening to a few songs. Okay, well, what are the highlights in this? And then, then of course, then is my episode. So now I've got to sit and listen to this song three or four times and then sit and listen to it and stop it and rewind it and stop it and rewind yeah. it and then scan forward to see if that's the same here and all that kind of stuff, the, the, the rigor of it. But when you listen to this album, just as an album, you put it on, 
like I said, I think top to bottom, it's flawless. The songs are great. The performances are great. The production's great. The sequencing is fantastic on this album. When you close side one with all or nothing. Yeah. I mean, that's that's your bow out on side one. Is there a song that's going to make you want to pick up the album, turn it over and put on side two more than that song, you know? Yeah, totally. I absolutely agree. And today, like, you know, when you, you, you say, this is such a you thing to say, but when you listen to an album, just when you think you've listened to it enough times, you've got everything out of it, something else will come along. And yeah. surprise you get today. I was just thinking how of all the petty albums, this one probably more than any other is so built for the country. It's so built for the countryside. It's so built for the big landscape. It's so built for the the open road more yeah. than any other album, I think. And I'm, I'm, you know, I could be wrong, but my feeling is, is that it's a journey album. It's very much the, the it's, it's a storytelling album the, more than any other. I mean, he's a great storyteller, Tom Petty, yeah. as you know, but like the, it's just the the from the music video of learning to fly the big um, the the fluffy clouds that went and the go airplane that, hangar and yeah U- Utah or something wasn't it and from that all the way to like you know um, a red wing hawk is circling the flat top stretches out for days you know those kind of things and then like we're built to last you know that the the ending track or making some noise you know where he's like he heard a he heard a he plugged in his guitar. And he played a song and he heard it across the canyon. Yeah. You know, it's it's an epic sounding album, right? It's sorry, an epic lyrically, it's epic. Yeah. And 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 yet really funny, you know, two gun two gunslingers, right? Oh man. And, and... I was gonna say with two gunslingers, there's a there's a thing that always crosses my mind. It's the line, you know, this is the last one of these gunfights you're ever gonna drag me to. <laughs> but it's that line. It always reminds me of Life of Brian when he's trudging behind his mother to be stoning. Yeah. It's like, oh, for God's sake, another one. <laughs> so there's just always that comical yeah. bit. But, it, but it's also at the same yeah. time quite a deep message. You know, it's totally. stop fighting. Why why are we doing this? Like, what's going on? So there, it like you said, it's got that it's got this massive scope to it, and yet there's still small moments on it that are sort of just really? little little sort of vignette things inside this thing that's you know I, last dj obviously was sort of a, a concept album you know quote unquote i think this one's sort of got a bit of a through line too as well right yeah too as yeah, well yeah. like i said it's yeah, integrated yeah. wide open it's that sense of scale it's that sense of forward momentum and forward yeah. momentum, so and of course like this is the thing isn't it you know just just to really hop back to really quickly to the you know that in the song two two gun slingers when it's like yeah. you know this is this is the last the last one of gunfights you're ever going to travel to or is it like the the crowd hiss and booed yeah, and yeah everyone hiss and booed yeah. Yeah. in the background <laughs> I fucking love the kid I love that and it's a grown up I love that it's yeah. just Brit that's British humor that is that's yeah. Jeff Lynn going you know what if we put you know would we put like that in there and Tom <laughs> the Tom's sense of humor being from you know so on the money he's from yeah. yeah you know he's probably yeah you know why not or whatever i don't know yeah i mean you know and that, you one, know, was that one was cool right right attention <laughs> cd listeners you know and all that kind of shit <laughs> love that brilliant <laughs> epic epic there's nothing like that's on a cassette sorry that's just on a cassette right As a it's kid, on the cassette version yeah 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 and, and and you're like you're sitting there in the back of the car your mum and dad driving and Side one's ended, and then Tom Petty's voice comes on, you know. Yeah, <laughs> take the cassette out, or whatever, and turn it over. It's like, what? It's yeah. brilliant. This is absolute magic. Who else would do that? It's so and, relaxed. And just get yeah. get away with it. Yeah, I love it. It's when I've when it so when my daughter and I go play pool at the pool hall, we always take over the jukebox. Like we go yeah. like put 10 bucks at a time in and we I just I know, play, I heard you talk about that the other day. And, and, it, and it's the same thing. Well, whatever we, whatever we play running down a dream, of course yeah. that hidden track always comes on afterwards. But there's that little gap. And so yeah. you can see everyone in the pool hall like, look at what they're doing. What's going on here? What is this now? <laughs> <laughs> it's just wonderful. Oh, man. I love I love that story you told the other day. I think you should do that more. I think like, you know, like it's a, it's a special thing you have with your daughter, and and I hope to have that with my my two daughters when I'm older. You know, um, I think a pool hall round here would probably be a dangerous idea, <laughs> but uh, but I, even for this, uh, but you know, it's really cute. You know, I really that's a really lovely picture that you paint in your head for your listeners. I think it's really cool. Oh, thanks, man. I wanted to talk to you. Speaking of daddies and daughters and and whatnot, uh, all or nothing. 
You as a, as a piece of lyric, a lyrical writing, and this is where I was going to ask you after this, but um, about Tom Petty as a lyricist. But if you li- if you yeah. look at the verses in this song, I mean, you want it all all or nothing. It's brilliant and it's savage and it's, it's visceral. Yeah. But the verses are so poetic. Your daddy was a sergeant major. You didn't want to, but he made you wipe his brass from time to time. It left a picture in your mind. Only Tom Petty writes that. Maybe Dylan. Yeah. Here I am, a fallen arrow. My lord is wide. My street is narrow. My skin yeah. is thicker. And I love how he separates yeah, that thicker. word. My heart is tougher. I don't mind working on search for And then the coup de grace, sweet chariots of LA swing low. At twilight yeah. time, the smog makes a rainbow. I think that's one of the best lyrics yeah. anyone's ever written. Unbelievable. Yeah. I th- well, I said I said this to Paul Zollo when I was doing it for my podcast was um fuck you, Petty. Fuck you, <laughs> Petty. And he, he he had a big chuckle at that because it is, it is just a moment where you go, Yeah, all right, mate, chill out. Yeah, look, you can write good lyrics. Just, just write something average, yeah. All right. Okay, you did zombies it. Fine. Whatever. But you know, just write something average. Yeah. It's unfair. Like exactly. You, you, you nailed it, man. You know, sweet chariots of LA swing low at twilight time. Smug makes a rainbow. It's Keep so... one eye on the weather. Yeah. It's so Keep visual, isn't it? It is, yeah. man. Yeah. Great picture, you know, picture painter. I've got in the in the toilette behind me, I have into the great wide open uh, vinyl cover framed. Yeah. And that every time I have a wee. Um, uh, but never when I have a number two because I don't want disrespect. You're facing away at that point. Exactly. exactly, You know, and I'm never going to take it off the wall. Never going to take it off the wall and specifically look at it whilst I'm having a poo because that's deeply disrespectful. You know, it's like, you know, poor poor man, poor man. But, you know, that album cover, I, you know, this. It is, man. Like, I have toyed with getting that done as a tattoo for many a year, but I, I, you know, I don't know. The whole, my whole, probably take up my whole chest. A back tattoo. And it would be, it would be difficult because it's framed, right? With it being framed, it's this. But yeah, Czech artist Jan Matulka in 1921. It's called Autumn Landscape. And it's owned by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So there you go. Yeah. I'll probably get it because I've got the one of um, Southern Accents, the um, Return Veteran or whatever. The veteran in the it. New Field, yeah. Yeah, by Old Matey. And I've, I've, I've got that frame. That, I think I was inspired to do that by you, actually, because you, I think you either posted it, a picture of the album, and or highlighted the artist. And I was like, I want to get that. Yeah. So, well, you know, people are, you know, um and are about Southern Accents. So I think it's a pretty good album. But, but, um, yeah, no, no, it is. Yeah, a lyricist. He he's second to none, and that man, all or nothing. Especially, how about that vocal as well? I mean, I know it's going oh, back to man. production rather than the lyrics, but you want it all. It's like, yeah, I've always wanted. I've always wanted to ask you whether you know or not what mics were used on this album specifically for, you, you know, to get that insanely close to the mic feel. Yeah, but still, but no overdrive, and like the learning to fly particularly as well. You know. It's a good question because I know that it was recorded in part of this was definitely recorded in Mike's garage again. Yeah. And then there was a, it's a studio in California somewhere. And I can't remember where it is, but it's Jeff Lynn will definitely would have sort of wanted specific equipment. So I'll look into that. Cause that's a really good question. Will I'm not hundred <laughs> percent sure. Good question. I, 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 I just, I just hope one day this podcast gets big enough or so it reaches someone of influence where you can have a chat with Jeff Lynn because yeah. that's that's the key to it all, isn't it? Because that'd be know, the dream. Yeah, it would be. You'd be running down the dream, dear boy, running it all the way down. Well, I mean, um, the, the ones I always look at are, you know, the dream as a fan is to yeah. sit with Jeff Lynn with the oh, tapes and the mixing board, Christ. and Christ. just drop things out and bring things back in and say, "Well, what was that? How did you record that? Ah, oh, okay, so that was ah, you know, because you just get insights that because he's so good at mixing." Yeah. But his parts are distinct, but he's got that way of blending them. So I'm not totally. quite sure. Like we just again on King's Highway, there in when it comes into the verse, there's ooze in there. I'm pretty sure the vocal ooze, but it could be an organ as well. Because okay. he's the way he's mixed it, you can't quite tell exactly what it is, right? So yeah, such a brilliant producer. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. I just think it would be like just on an emotional level, what it would be like specifically for me for this album to have all the yeah. instrumentation taken out and just have uh tp's like vocal in there it would it would it would probably instantly boo i'd probably just cry i'd probably yeah. just break down and cry you know it's like when you hear you know like a 
they have uh, they reminisce over like Nevermind and they take out all the vocals and just have Kurt's voice and it's like yeah. oh I always struggle with that I that really 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 messes with my head and I you know because why why is that but but with with Tom it's like I think that would freak me out but I'd love to hear it I'd absolutely yeah. love to hear someone pick him apart and like but but you know on 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 the other hand maybe it takes too much of the do you see too much behind the curtain I don't know I never can that honestly like and it never, it, it never it never spoils yeah. it for me because like I said yeah. that's one thing that when you do dig in and when you listen with a musician's ear which is a different thing from just listening casually as you know I mean you, when you're learning a song you've got to be able to listen to what's the bass doing you've got to be able to hear that and if you can't then yeah. It makes it difficult it's just made me appreciate appreciate it more yeah exactly. because and one thing like you know one thing that's made me appreciate definitely is how bloody good a technical vocalist tom petty was and he just gets completely overlooked for that in all the conversations about great singers a brilliant singer an absolutely yeah. brilliant singer but i think do you know what it's when you say that I, I i do pick up on that i do acknowledge that that is an actual fact and you're not just saying that because you you know you've got a fucking tom petty podcast but having said that, I would, if he did start getting too much recognition, I'd be like, yeah, but no, not too much. Cause he's my yeah. secret. He's my little yeah. Tom Petty is in my top pocket. And I, I like that. He's my secret. It's like when people, when Weezer bought out their third album, the hash pipe and Island in the sun went through the roof. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. Weezer are my band back yeah. off. Yeah, you know, and it's pathetic. It's it is largely pathetic, but um, I would like to just be pathetic on my own. You know, I know what you mean. Um, I know exactly what you mean. But having said that, would be you know, whenever I'm the rare occasion in my life where I bumped into Tom Petty fans in the UK, it, it's a it's it's like meeting someone who follows Southampton or Man United. Or whatever. <laughs> well, not Man United because every every you know <laughs> that word <laughs> you, you know follows man and i especially when i was growing up in the uh 80s 90s but like but yeah you know it's a secret club and i you know yes he's he is he is underrated it's true and um perhaps this album a lot you know and and it's funny isn't it because like learning to fly isn't one of those songs where it's really high up there it's not nope. like f or, or whatever or d or whatever it's 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 a mid mid-range and he's not pounding out the vocal and nope. yet it, it just soars right yeah well especially that the, the version from Gainesville on the running down a dream documentary when he sings it you know mainly acoustic it's just I mean like you said I'm not a, I don't I'm an atheist I don't believe I'm a heathen yeah but that's spiritual to me <laughs> that, that's just that experience of when music hits you that hard yeah. There's something there that's that's that connection to some other person that's what I think spirituality really is it's you connected to something else something bigger you know yeah. and so i wanted to ask you then we've talked a, a little bit about some well, of course yeah yeah I'm, I'm a humanist i like humans generally i mean more or less <laughs> not not so much some days but generally um we've got you know learning to fly is the big single on this it's not one of the songs i don't think that's massively overplayed from tom petty out of his sort of the greatest hits stuff into great wide open similarly you're not going to come across that too often on radio i don't think i mean uk is like you said doesn't play petty a lot but it's the deep cuts on this album that are the ones that are you always go back to. All the wrong reasons. Yeah. I mean, is a song again that sounds like nothing else in the catalogue. And you've got Roger McQuinn yeah. on back and drop vocals. Too good to be true. Almost sounds like I always think that man. I could hear Chrissy Hines singing that. I could hear. Yeah. The, I could hear the Pretenders doing Too Good to Be True. And out of the cold, that another riff. This could, screaming me, rock riff. Can you give me uh, all the all or nothing? Okay, sorry, um, all the wrong reasons. Give me a, a freaking. Yeah, lyric funny. from that because that is driving me mental you know when you get into a conversation with someone and you're like oh yeah i know this album like the back of my hand and all of a sudden i've forgotten every everything about yeah. that song it's that oh, oh, oh down oh, right, yeah, it so, yeah and it just yeah, again yeah, yeah. and Beautiful. i think it's because of that refrain it's just, yeah it's just unique in the petty castle and there's there's a few on this album that are unique yeah. in the petty castle like it making some noise doesn't yeah. really sound like anything else, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, but that, that yeah, I, I think like, I, I've never really advocated for like swapping in, taking Ben Bon out of any lineup. Yeah. Sorry, any, you know, uh, Petty Am. But it would be quite funny to have Bruce Hornsby on, on that song, just like doing a piano solo on that. Like, I'm, a, yeah. I'm not a massive Hornsby fan, but I do like, um, 
Uh, that's the way it is. That that album is it's a great piano one. He's a good, he's a good piano. Yeah, player. he's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And then Dark of the Sun, you've got on there, which oh. I've always I love the contradiction in that title. God, Again, he's so good with words. Song. You know, he's just such a good with his wordplay. You know, I mean, but but how how good is that intro as well? That 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 really yeah beautifully soft guitar. So the guitar picking, you know, look, I'll be like. I've got a raging cold, so I can't art- I can't <laughs> sing it. But like this, it's absolutely beautiful. You know, Mike just playing exactly what the song needs. You know, yeah. and it's it, again, it's just the open road, right? It's into the great wide open. It's everything yeah. that you want. It's got that beautiful. I don't know what tempo is on that song. I don't know what you would what point you is like one ten, one fifteen, or something. It's just like the tempo, yeah, for sure, absolutely. It's everything you need it's just you are cruising and the yeah. sun is going down you know <laughs> what is the dark of the sun who bloody cares yeah you know Doesn't listen matter. who bloody cares listen to the song come <laughs> back here yellow and keep on playing <laughs> um you and i will meet again i wanted to ask you this i was thinking about oh, this today as i was God. re-listening I, it's it's sort of in a way to me it's the most beatlesy and sort of specifically harrisony song that yeah. tom wrote you can imagine it being a wilbury song you know with, with dylan oh, yeah, and george could definitely. take a verse in that one it's got that same and yeah. I, was, I was thinking about this again i was just tom wrote way more stuff that sounds like george and paul than he did stuff that sounded like john <laughs> yeah lyrically yeah, he definitely. wrote lyrics especially later on that sounded a bit more like john were a bit more abrasive but melodically yeah. He was a, he was a Paul and George guy, totally. totally. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that completely. But like that that song, you're, you're absolutely spot on with the uh, with that with that uh, takedown on that because um, um, it is a be- it's a beautiful song, and I do and I do. Oh man, like so so much of me just like do you know what? Like if again, if you could just for a live environment i know we'll probably touch on that later but you know musicianship and who you bring in and bring out but like yeah yeah the way the way that that song is is yeah it's, it's one of those things it gets it gets to you but i think i think that's what these people were they hung around one another so much they just caught fire like that whole they got the dna of how to write these perfect songs they got it mm-hmm. down because because they hung out with freaking george harrison um uh, <laughs> Just to hang out with George Harrison for long enough, you get like they 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 he can deconstruct the DNA of why a Beatles song works. And yeah. Jeff Lynne is clearly all ears, eyes open. He is like he, I don't think there's a moment in the studio where Jeff Lynne isn't tapping in to what the geniuses are doing, you know, yeah. and learn and learning from it because he's a genius himself. Jesus Christ, for God's yeah. sake, you know. But just they were also, and that's the thing that always gets me about the Wilburys. And again, we're going to be talking about that, but. Jeff Lynne, Tom Petty, Mike Campbell, Ben Montench, they were all top-tier musicians and songwriters yeah. and performers, but they were also students of music still. They never stopped wanting to learn. They never stopped yeah. learning, and they never stopped exposing themselves to things that will make their music and their performances better, which I think is – that's the thing that separates the, that level of musicians that last and are durable and have sort of longevity. I think that's the thing that really, really separates yeah. those guys. Yeah, well, I, know, I met Ringo Starr a number of times. I was work, basically I was a groundsman there for on his estate down in Cranley in um, Surrey. Uh, I don't know why I did different accents there. Weird. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I was a groundsman there for a couple of years, and my my mate's dad was the head groundskeeper, and he got me a job there. And um, yeah, and I just I was I was super blessed. Like on my first day, Kev. Right, this is crazy. The he did have to do this. My boss at the time didn't have to do this he knocked on the studio door and introduced me to Ringo and his producer at the time I don't know who wow. it would have been I said oh this is Will the new member of staff and um you know Ringo was like oh well welcome aboard the mud ship you know <laughs> or whatever it was and I was like okay cheers yeah cheers and, and before I went in, he said look you know my my boss was like look if you know just call him Mr Starkey you know yeah. Um, and I obviously would, I, I if I called him Ringo ever, if I had, I, I probably would have been fired instantly. Well, I doubt it. But, you know, um, it was just mental, totally yeah. mental. Ned did not have to do that, my boss. And equally, Ringo did not have to go, well, you know, welcome aboard. And, yeah. you know, don't let him give you too much shit. <laughs> and, and, and then I was like, oh, he's just Beatles just sworn. Okay, that's is that allowed? Yeah. Is he allowed to do that? Um, and then yeah, that was it. And then I mean, there's a loads of look, you need an hour 
to, yeah. uh, for me to go through this. But yeah, there are there is a massive anecdote about me playing his drum kit, me him having a chat with him about his musical influences and Tom Petty and and then him seeing my tattoo and a massive chat about Johnny Cash. But honestly, it's an hour. It's a fucking hour conversation, yeah. mate. So it's great. I always think that there's a level of sort of fame or, or prestige or, the, you know, because we get to a certain level in our an age in our life where I'm not that impressed by people's achievements anymore. But there are still people that I think if I met in real life, I don't know how I'd handle it. And Ringo's one of them. Paul's one of them. I think Tom probably would have been one of them. And I'm worried that yeah. if, I ever, if I ever get to speak to Mike, Mike might be one of them. But but Ringo, like you said, face to face with Ringo, but he's just a dude. He's just a musician. Yeah. You know, people because forget it's, that, you know. But I think I was at a stage in my life where I was um, I was a little bit more uh, um, what do you call it like um, I didn't give a fuck like not in a good way either like I was yeah. a very much falling off like the edge into a like a kind of bit of despair so I was like yeah I'll just talk to you because I just don't give a fuck and yeah. now I think if I was to meet Rigo I'd be like shit um, similarly I I think you would you'd be fine with Tom I think it's Mike that might be because Mike's very reserved yeah. but like I think. Um, but one of the situations you would have shit yourself would have been at Ringo's 70th. Really, really quickly, okay. So I know that yeah. we've we've got time here. But I I'm I'm doing the car, like it's his 70th birthday, and Ringo's like asking the ground staff to show people where to park. So after we do that, you know, we're all dressed in our finest. It's Wimbledon, Wimbledon men's Wimbledon final day. It's right. crazy. And Fucking who should roll up the bloody drive, but only bloody David Gilmore and his family. But in this wow. ridiculously tiny green kind of like Toyota Igo kind of <laughs> fuel saving car. And like he rolls down his window and goes, yeah, where should I park? You know, like rock royalty. And go, oh, yeah. if you just please, be, you know, go down there, please, Mr. Gilmore. And he was like, you know, I was like, fuck yeah, no. like, yeah. He knows that I know who the fuck he is. But anyway, <laughs> fast forward like an hour. <laughs> Rick, Paul McCartney, right? Paul McCartney's uh, chatting away um, with Ringo. Um, Paul, uh, Ringo introduced me to Paul McCartney. You know, just really like, oh, here's a member of my staff, William, and wow. and and then you know, Paul's like, just gives me a nice cursory nod, and he's got he's pressed for time anyway. Yeah, and there's freaking Brian Johnson, AC freaking <laughs> DC. I was, he was adorable, about three, yeah. three foot tall, adorable, the most <laughs> adorable man I've ever met in my life. Like I next to Paul Zollo, I think. And, um, and like, he was talking to me about, you know, I talked to him about the first time I saw ACDC and he loved it. He was adorable with it. Um, old mate from the Eagles, Joe Walsh was there. Crazy. Oh, wow. Trucker. Yeah. He was nuts. <laughs> it was always, truly always has been. I mean, he always has been. Yeah. He, he's and then, always been crazy. But the, the bet, you know, I was just, Mike Rutherford, you know Mike Rutherford from, you know, sure do. Mike, Mike Rutherford, of course, you'd love him. Um, he was, because he, he used to pop around and see Ringo a lot. So he, he, he'd always used to stop his car and wind down a window and go, it's really, this place is looking lovely, really great job. And I'd always go, thank you so much, Mr. Rutherford. Thanks so much. And yeah. and then, but he and I ended up talking for like 15, 20 minutes. And Dave Gilmore comes up and starts talking. And he, he gets so, it was so disappointing as soon as he knew that I was staff, he yeah. gave me the most dirtiest look and he just literally turned away from me. And I'll never yeah. forget that. And I was so wow. disappointed because I love Pink Floyd. Yeah. Not that, screw it, doesn't I, st- I haven't stopped listening to Pink Floyd, you know? It scans and, though with Gilmore. I can, I, can, I hate to say it, but it, I can kind of see that. Oh, I would have been more surprised. I would have been more surprised if you'd said Brian Johnson. Oh, really? You know yeah. what I mean? If, if yeah. you said Brian Johnson was a dick, I would have been like, oh, really? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I can sort of see that. I kind of, yeah. You the, know. If, yeah, for those that don't know, like Godalming, uh, he went to Ch- they went, he went to Charterhouse, very, very posh, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So it was just that whole sort of, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. You won't do it at all. But so did Rutherford. So, yeah. Mark Rutherford went to Charterhouse as well, right? So. Yeah. But I think he, he was, oh, I loved him. I loved him so much. It's a lovely guy. Big, fat hair. Loved him. Yeah. And then just to end this point, they all jammed at the end. Oh, Gary Brooker was there as well. The late, great Gary Brooker. And he was just on organ. They did, you know, White Shade of Pale. And you got Ringo. They, they did some Beatles songs, like, you know, the, the ones that Ringo sang. And it, all the families were videoing it on their phones as well. It was hilarious. Wow. Totally mental. Totally mental, totally mental, mate. Like, you, it was a dream. It was a total dream. Yeah. 
it's yeah, very very cool changing. well yeah, thanks for telling the story cool. man i mean it, again it's <laughs> i think at some point though wouldn't you be like well, oh it's just well paul mccartney's here as well oh, and Mark. but at some point you're just like okay well that's just him again then and oh, then like, another person look i want to i've got give me 10 minutes i need to just go and go to the bathroom like just oh another famous Mate. person <laughs> yeah no it was crazy and i had i had i had i had quite a few beers and by the end of it i was actually really loosened really loosened up and just just relaxed yeah uh, uh you know and then just watching paul mccartney get into this private helicopter and uh <laughs> sail away fly away it was mental it's hilarious actually because we deliberately did a lowercase h on the field for right. the helicopter to land <laughs> <laughs> i think they did that in a film and i said, oh that is lower, so good do a lowercase h lads it would be absolutely hilarious so it's to, to great. spray it on there oh it's hilarious yeah <laughs> Oh boy. Okay. Okay. Well, look, we've got to wrap up. Okay. Gonna... I'm, I'm sorry, man. It's been no, like no, the no. longest hey. chat you've, you've ever had, I think. It's great. But, you know. uh, no, John Scott was. No, Scott Haskin, the Petty Eight. Scott Haskin, we were okay. on three yeah. and a half hours. Three and a half hours. Which got Jesus. condensed down to an hour and 15 and 45 wow. or something. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing editing work. Um, but just to say really quickly that John Scott conversation was amazing, though. I mean, that's why I mean, that's why I want to speak to Warren too, because then I've I've got the set then, right? The canonical the works, the trilogy. It's Paul Zolo, John Scott, and Warren Zane. So those are the three that yeah. are primary sources and everything else. But we've got to I work mean, on getting we've got to work on getting a heartbreaker on this show. We've got to. It's got to yeah. happen. You though, well, we didn't talk a little bit about you have your own record store. Oh very, god, yeah. Very right. specific and very lovely connection back to Tom Petty. So tell people about the store, tell people where they can find you if they want to talk to you, tell them about the podcast if they can if they want to go and listen to that and you any music you've got kicking around. Yeah, the, the Limehouse podcast, that is that's if you want to chat or to chat. So if you're listening to you know, the likes of uh, Michael Palin or uh, Christopher Guest, uh Michael McKean, you know, Spinal Tap Lot. Oh god, the list goes on. There's so many people on, on the on the Limehouse podcast. That's on you know all your usual platforms. Uh, my 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 record label is called my record label. My it's getting late, isn't it? My <laughs> record shop is called Wildflower Records, named after Wildflower, uh, obviously. Um, and that that I did like I set up about a year and a half ago, and uh, yeah, it's going okay. You know, I've, I've actually sold a few pet records there. Um, awesome. So uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, man. But if, if you know if you want to listen to any of my bands or anything, um, I've been in. Christ, whoever the name of God is going to go on listening to my music, I'll be amazed. And if they hey. do, mate, they can contact this show and I will send them a tenner. <laughs> there you have it, um, folks. Free money. Dad's, yeah. Dad's Dance Best. You can listen to my music there. And it's, it's very petty and it's very Ramones. It's very, you know, poppy and fun. Cool. Come on, nice. I'll get those links. And so look for those links in the episode notes, folks, because that's where I'm going to drop everything. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure, as it always is yeah. talking to you. We've chatted a couple times, at least online, and it's always a laugh. So hopefully this yeah. isn't the last time we talk. Hopefully not, man. I love you so much. I love so much what you do. It's really very, very important. And I love your genuine love for the people you have on um, and, and Tom's work. It's amazing. Such a legacy. It's really amazing. Very important what you're doing, my man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, man. Yeah, no sweat.